adopting the California standard along with 17 other states. Uh, so by 2035, new cars must be zero emissions. Doesn't affect existing cars or, or used cars, but uh, that is one thing that we're that we're doing uh, in terms of goals. Uh, we have a goal that 25 percent of all registered vehicles in the district will be zero emissions by 2030. Uh, we have a ways to go, because right now that's 2.6%. And uh, for brand new vehicles being purchased, I think last year, 50% were zero emission. Um, so, so we're getting there, and I think, you know, um, my belief is that we really need to push hard on the charters to get more more chargers out there so that people can feel more comfortable buying uh, EVs. But we, need, we are uh, very, very interested in partnering with uh, other organizations. We've had great success with uh, the Greater Washington Region Clean Cities and look forward to more of that in the future. Uh, we, I think it's good for people to just be vocal uh, and you know chime in on things like this uh, legislation that's going through the DC Council you know, DDOT is looking at various policies on, you know, curbside charging, etc. cetera. Um, agencies like, like us, we need to hear from uh, our constituents to, to, for you to tell us exactly uh, what you need. And, you know, we'll be able to best advocate for you when, when folks uh, speak up. So I would definitely, definitely encourage that. So one thing, I, I'm going to go to the audience in the next one. Uh, one of the things that I see across the, um, uh, the region is one is around um, charging at work. So we have a workplace charging program. Uh, schools are putting uh, charging for the bus drivers to drive the buses, but those same schools don't have charging for the workers. Uh, the district is putting charging on the, you know, different places, but many of the work sites don't have charging. Um, and the, I'm a real estate guy as well, and the real estate folks want people back in the office. <laughs> Although my wife's in real estate, she's 100% work-by-work person. Work, work. <laughs> but we know that many companies are struggling with that. We have an uptick, as you indicated, of folks going to, um, going to EV and got to feel comfortable. One of the things that people, as well as e-bikes, whether it's um, cars, what are we doing to get uh, electrification for for the uh, workers at the workplace? Yeah, I think I can start with that. So I know in my building, we have a garage and there's some chargers in our garage, but we need more chargers there. Um, so, We've been pushing for uh, putting in these charters at uh, city-owned properties, libraries, rec centers, schools, and we've gotten grant funding through CFI or through many other, other methods. And um, with our sister agencies, it's amazing. We come to them, you know, free charger. You don't have to own it. You don't have to manage it, and they'll even give you some revenue. And it's just um, often not a priority for these agencies because they're busy. They're, is he running an agency? So um, I think that the employees need to speak up and be more vocal and say, hey, you know, I would like to purchase an EV. You know, um, if only my workplace had a charger, that would, that would, is something that I could do. Well, you know, just to kind of speak to from a school, because you're dealing with one, one plant, or could per se just one set of facilities. Um, the important thing from an agency standpoint is to look at your capital improvement plans and say, hey, on this program, where we're renovating a school every 15 years, but we're planning for it five years out, you have to start planning today, um, not only for school bus charging, for employee charging, but for student who parks for their charges. And as the society gets more on in the space of driving electric vehicles, your demand is gonna go up. And you can't start breaking ground, you know, when the demand is there, or when we get to 2035 and all cars going forward are electric. 
you know, we have to start really having that foresight to kind of think it through and say these are the things that we're going to need 10 to 15 years from now. So, those, so that's the important to work in the space and continue to working between the schools, between the county organizations, and saying, hey, this is these are the things that we're going to need. These are the everybody working in together. That's why you know the board of supervisors, the board and the board of school board both came together and said, hey, county all together, schools, utilities, police department. You guys are all going to have to work together to establish charging infrastructure. So let me ask you this. Uh, let me I'm gonna pause on my uh, deployment question around equity, uh, and I want to go to the audience. Any questions from the audience? All right, go to this uh, person with the tan. State your name and organization. Hi, I'm Theo. I'm from uh, the Eastern Pennsylvania Alliance for Green Transportation, so the Green Cities Coalition up there. Um, but I live in D.C. in the top circle. Um, I, last summer, I did a lot of research on green infrastructure and the impact on gentrification. So I just thought for the public charging stations that are going to be implemented, how do we prevent those from causing gentrification and keeping the amenities from going to the communities that need them? Okay. Um, wow, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Good question. How do you prevent gentrification? Um, yeah, I think we're, at this point, we are so far behind in public charging infrastructure that I just, I don't know if that has been, has been an issue. I mean, that would be a good problem to have. We've got so many chargers that people are complaining that it's gentrifying their neighborhood. And I was just in uh, Fort Lauderdale for a basketball tournament with my son. And I rented an EV with, with Hertz. And there are no EV chargers in Fort Lauderdale anywhere. Uh, so I was very worried about being able to return my vehicle with a charge, so I you know, have to pay money to Hertz. But um, yeah, I know we, we, you know, our focus is just to, you know, so that, you know, if you live in a single family home in Ward 3 and you have a garage and driveway, you know, it's not. Uh, a big stretch maybe for you to buy a Tesla, get a charger, you know, you can go EV, but a lot of, a lot of folks don't have the option because, um, you know, they don't have a driveway, they don't park on the street, um, and they would consider getting an EV, but if, if they only had a place to charge, or maybe they live in a condo, maybe they live in an apartment building, and, you know, their landlord is not that big on the, the idea of, uh, of EV, so, um, yeah, I hope we get to a point where we're you know, having that, that conversation, but I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. The, the other thing I was going to mention that with, uh, go ahead, Pablo, you were saying? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm not jumping on that one. No, I was not So let me just say this for you. Um, equity is really important because um, if we're not intentional now, in five to seven years, people are going to say, how did that happen, right? Because right now the model is a market-driven approach, yeah. meaning that the companies they look for uh, where the um, DMV registrations are by zip code and decide where they're going to put charging. So that's why public charging becomes ex uh, extremely important now, so that in five to seven years we're we're not having these ridiculous conversations about charging deserts because it's already that if we're not intentional, it will only get worse. So the fear is, is as Al indicated, that um, people are already clamoring every time you go to public events, every time we are participating in public events, people go, oh, I want to get an EV, but where am I going to charge it? So that delays the purchase, right? So what's going to happen is, in a few years, all these reporters will start writing stories about under, um, limited access in disadvantaged communities. Because we're saying you gotta get the EV before we put the charges. But some of you may be young enough to remember this was the same thing around uh, the internet back in the day, right? Just getting internet in communities, they said, well, they don't have computers in their homes, so why should we put money over there first? Then we went from just having internet to having high-speed internet, right? And we learned a lesson from COVID, or maybe we didn't. During COVID, <laughs> what happened during COVID? We all needed it. 
Everyone in the internet, they gave, and it was in D.C. and across the country, they gave kids laptop computers. Some that had been there in, in closets for years, right? They miraculously appeared and gave kids computers, and what happened? No, no high speed. No, hot speed. no high speed and no internet. So we know the problem is coming, right? And so the question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? So he needs to hear from you. I agree with them. We testify in front of the, uh, uh, not only these local state governments, and we say comments to the feds all the time. All the libraries, all the community centers, all the, we need curbside charters, right? Half of Americans don't even have a garage, right? We got to deal with the gas stations, right? We got to help them realize that this change is coming because we, we can't just get rid of all the gas stations, right? And we got to deal with the underground tanks. So anyhow, I uh, saw another hand in the back. Yes, you have to come up for Mr. Washington, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Clint Washington with uh, Clint Center Construction Managers and Consultants. We're also a member of Great Washington from the City's Coalition. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering from the standpoint of the school buses, I mean, you mentioned the cost differential associated with that initial purchase. Has there been any economic analysis associated with the fuel that goes into the gas property and the electricity that goes into the electric charge, you know, the electric buses? Have you taken into account the economics associated with over time, whether or not things balance out? I mean, even though you got that high initial investment. No, no, that's a great question, Mr. Washington. Um, we are looking at uh, the cost per kilowatt hour of utilizing the buses, um, how far they go compared to diesel. Um, one of the major things, we're getting a small bit of savings with that using electric over diesel because um, of the prices of diesel fuel structuring. But the more important thing is where we're seeing the biggest part of it is the maintenance. Um, you have less moving parts on an electrical bus. So you're not getting, replacing oil, replacing filters, more, more you know, ball bearings, things of that nature. So your cost of ownership of the bus is gonna go down as well. And that's what we're starting to see in this year. All right, we'll come down front, I'm gonna take uh, one last thing. Um, you, Mr. Steven, for the coming today. If I can just, just answer your question really quickly so I get us some closing comments so that we can wrap up so we can stay on time for the afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really impressed by the plans. Uh, 1600 electric uh, buses by 2035, uh, that's my top data actually. Uh, that's also in my definition. It's about 160 megawatts. Additional charge to the utility. Uh, so if you, if you multiply that across the county, it's not going to uh, do a few fuses around the county. <laughs> so, uh, and the solution obviously is decentralization, uh, decentralization of power. And I was wondering, are you considering in your long term plan uh, expanding uh, the schools to microcaps that combine? The fleets with uh, heat pumps, with uh, solar, and a uh, few other things. So, yes, um, the first part, um, of course, um, the high energy demand on the, on the grid is going to be high. I think you have to walk hand in hand with your electric uh, company. Um, Dominion Energy has been a great partner with us, and they are already having uh, grids that they look at and saying, hey, we can put 150 buses here, we can put 200 buses here, they're already building the infrastructure. Um, part of that uh, agreement that we have with the Union Energy is for vehicle to grid. Um, so that's that first part of, of can you, creating. Can you explain really quickly for vehicle to grid? Yeah, to so vehicle to grid is being able to go both ways with uh, the electricity. So in the middle of the summer, this high peak time, um, when you know there's gonna be a big, everyone's running the air conditioning. So we have the ability to utilize the buses as a supplemental charge or supplemental power to the grid. So we're not just always taking charge, but we're able to give back. Mm -hmm. So that's like that first part of creating that, uh, that uh, microgrid, as you say. And also looking at, from a facility standpoint, 
we are building buildings that are able to harness solar power, um, you, you know, wind, and all different types of energies and building it also in the buses and making sure the buses are utilized as a redundancy to it all. So when we need cooling centers, when we have blackouts, we we'll have buses that's charged that's able to plug into the buildings to kind of create, create uh, electricity for, for schools. Yeah, I heard that. That's what, now that's the future. Yeah. You heard blackouts, yeah. brownouts, yeah. you got an electric school bus, repower the community, repower the school, especially the warming area. That's great. Uh, Yes. We're going to take our last um, question in the back and then we got to wrap up. Okay. So this is what the gentleman from DOE. Have, have y'all looked at the short term lease industry in this, this city called Airbnb room and the impact that they've had on the motel, hotel industry and with people not staying in hotels but living in private residence out in the city as a way to deploy more EV charging infrastructure at those short-term lease industries because it, it, it's an issue. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, having just stayed in a hotel a few days ago, I can see you know where people who are traveling they need a place to charge, and I just think I just read something about I think Charge Point, one of the big EV charging companies is partnering with, with Airbnb, so I think the companies are trying to promote that idea. Um, but yeah, you make a really good point uh, that we really need to think about uh, that, the impact that it has, and how we you know, can best take advantage of it, or at least be aware of it. I love it. And we have a member um, called Chargerzilla. Uh, if you all are interested, we'll make sure uh, they speak at a conference in November and October. You, um, there's actually a program where you have an EV charger at your home. It's like an Airbnb an EV charger. They will actually, you can actually be a site host, right? You can go on an app and, that, and people can come to your home. You got an appointment, obviously, and they can charge in the garage or charge outside of your home. And you get paid for that. Yeah. So, so I want you all to know about ChargerZilla. Okay, I'll make sure. Um, you all you know, um, can tap into it, become a host, get in early. All right. All right, any final comments? No. Just excited to continue to create a path forward. All right. Yeah, just uh, thanks, Antoine and Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition for inviting us. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here to listen. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Quick two minute break, but I want to bring up Paul Winters from Clean Foods Alliance America. He's one of our sponsors. Just want to have him come up and say a few words. <laughs> you know, heard him say earlier, but I wanted him to come up and just to say uh, thank you and a couple words about uh, they've really taken a big uh, jump into the environmental justice work. They have a foundation. Uh, uh, as well, and just wanted to just say a few words about being a sponsor today. Yeah, I'm honored to be a sponsor of the, this event, and I'm very uh, happy to work with Antoine. Try to keep up with Antoine. <laughs> 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 um, it is wonderful to have somebody who is so active on all of these issues and educating the community and working with other Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, good evening. My name is Jarrell Jones. I'm the community engagement liaison for wow. Greater Washington. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm the community engagement liaison for Greater Washington. Um, bear with me. My voice is a little under the weather today, um, but I'm going to give my best to you all. Um, today, our panel, the number four, is on best practices for community engagement, education, outreach for sustainable transportation. Now we have three lovely panelists here, uh, well established, um, three doctors as well. Um, 
the, well, my first introduction is Ms. Faustelia Moreau. Um, it's a principal at the Monarch of Infinite Possibilities, LLC, an organization that connects decision makers that want to engage with black, brown, and, and indigenous people of color and the faith-based community around the environmental issues and also the arts. The goal in making these connections is to raise the level of awareness about sustainable and a healthy environment. Um, thank you, Ms. Burrow. Next, we have Dr. Lemire Tehran. Um, is an associate professor at the Howard University in the Department of Earth, Environment, and Equity. His work is committed to advancing public science and environmental justice with research interests that include environmental health, energy policy, and urban and communities, community forestry. And last but not least, stepping in for Pastor Gilbert, um, we have Pastor and Dr. Banks, Kip Banks. One second, sorry. And Dr. Banks is a senior consultant with Values Partnership, former general secretary of the Progressive National Convention, and pastor of the East Washington Heights Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Banks is also the former director of theological education with the Congress of National Black Churches, where he oversaw efforts to empower black ministries, alliances on nationwide on a nationwide basis. Um, so please give a round of applause for our presentation. Um, now the panelists doesn't do we don't have any presentations. We're going to do an open forum discussion. Um, the first speaker we have is Dr. Lemire Tehran, who's going to start us off with his presentation. One, two, we're good, we're good. So my colleague to my right asked me, what are your open remarks? Are you gonna historicize this? I just came to talk about environmental justice. And just by a short hands, do we know what environmental justice is or isn't? So it looks like maybe about half of the half of the folks in the crowd know what environmental justice is. And I really want that to anchor today's conversation, or at least my portion of the conversation. In the spirit of the young colleague's question who just asked a few minutes ago about gentrification, what are the implications for these charging stations for gentrification. And I really appreciate the spirit of that question, but I think if you're asking that question, you're almost too late. And the reason I'm saying that you're too late is, think about the ubiquity of concentrated inequality and poverty in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, PG County, Montgomery County. Doesn't matter to me how many charging stations you have. You could have a one-to-one -one ratio. There are so many folks who are buying an electric vehicle will be so far out of reach and we're not centering those folks in the renewable energy transition, we're not serious about being climate smart, we're certainly not serious about environmental justice. So we need to have that as our anchor, at least according to me. So the most important question is, how do we democratize the decision making that we're going about in this room today? What do I mean about the democratization of decision making? The most important question, who's in this room right now, who's not in this room? And if all we're concerned about is, hey, let's get more EVs, more charging stations, it's a whole lot of people that that question, in this city, in the suburbs of this city, that question is not even relevant for it. That's what I mean by we have to center environmental justice. And guess what? That's fundamentally a race, racial issue. I was about to say, that's fundamentally a racist issue. That's fundamentally a racial issue because when you're talking about who's disproportionately poor, you're talking about brown folks in this country. When you talk about who have the high energy burdens, that's the percentage of your income that goes to pay for energy services, running that AC all day on a 90 plus degree day like this, that's disproportionately brown folks, disproportionately native people, energy burdens. You saw a website uh, at the very beginning, unlearnpower.org slash playbook. So I do a lot of work with energy policy, a lot of work with urban forestry. So if you go to that playbook, I'll say it one more time, I'm not selling you anything. Don't think it's something on the website to sell. You don't get charged with a dime. Go to the website, download the playbook, and you'll see, why is this guy taking me to an urban forestry playbook? We have to think dynamically. As we reinterpret land use in cities, we also have to reinterpret built infrastructure. I rode in today on a commuter train in the quiet car, 
probably is 100 seats in the car, three folks in the entire car. That's a renewable energy strategy. That's a transportation strategy that we got to start thinking deeply about because these trains are accessible for everybody. That $80,000 EV, yeah, I would like to have one charged up too. That's not going to be within the reach of so many people within this city. So we have a lot of built infrastructure that we got to think about how can we reimagine this infrastructure and make it democratized. And where do we bring in the trees on a hot day like this? Because we don't have forests, because we have built infrastructure that's replete with impervious surface, it's artificially hot. So your newscaster came on today and told you it's 96 degrees. We know in urban heat islands it could be up to 20 degrees warmer. So that's the type of integrative, that's the type of interdisciplinary thinking that we have to have when we're talking about renewable energy, when we're talking about climate smart communities, when we're talking about sustainable transportation. You have to democratize the discussion. It can't just be about EVs. And don't take this the wrong way. I saw somebody put up, put up the video camera. Don't just take the two minute clip or the two second clip where I said no EVs. No, that's not the point. Get three EVs. That's irrelevant to me. But that, realize that technology is going to be out of reach for so many people, like a million, tens of millions of people in this country. That's not democracy, folks. You have a transition where only, you know, somebody on average, a household on average, making three hundred plus thousand dollars a year. If only those folks can participate, that's not democracy. So if we want to talk about justice, let's talk about justice. And with that being said, I'll see the floor. So I'm going to focus on um, community engagement and really around the faith-based community and what it looks like to bring them in. And so first I want to thank Brother Antoine and um, the entire DWRCCC staff um, because being involved in this clean and green struggle is quite the work. And I just want to salute you. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm showing up in this space with optimism and openness, a willing heart. But I must be honest that my heart is heavy. And my heart is heavy because I grew up in the great state of New York, in the city of Buffalo, um, with the mighty Niagara Falls. And Buffalo was the last stop for freedom seekers before they crossed over into Canaan land, you know, the promised land um, in Canada. Now my heart is heavy because the quality of life uh, for the community has deteriorated and the health, health disparities are insurmountable. Now, I'm not a preacher, but I am an old school Pentecostal. And I tend to reference my roots when I speak. And like a preacher, my comments today, if I had to pick a title, I'd say, it's time to take the knot out. Because, like that gospel song says, uh, we're wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in Jesus. And see, I grew up in the old school, so they would say, you know, wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in the Lord. Wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in Jesus. He's my friend. And see, at the monarch, I, thank you. Thank you. Somebody <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, I focus on raising the level of awareness about the environment and the arts in the BIPOC community and in the faith-based community. And as an expert community engager, I prepare the table and invite everyone to come to the table and take what they need to be nourished. I've been doing this work for over 20 years, and my goal has been to shift the focus to be more involved and sustainable, and as well as protecting Mother Earth. I grew up in a community where we didn't know we were considered poor and marginalized because everyone knew each other and everyone looked out for one another. We even used to give people rides that were strangers back in the day in the community I grew up in. And I felt a level of freedom and protection and a genuine commitment to respecting every living thing. But now, because of intentional disinvestment, purposeful disregard for black and brown lives, and the dumping of chemicals, and um, just really contaminated the land we used to grow our food on, my heart is heavy. So back in 2006, before Flint happened, I realized that the church was the missing piece in the environmental movement. 
But to organize the church around the environmental movement is no small initiative. Think about the Baptists. That's one of the largest denominations. 8.5 million members. And my ambitious goal is to bring all of those denominations in the faith-based community together to make a global impact. So what are some of the best practices that we use to encourage and engage the EJ community? One, going where they are and bringing resources. So in Buffalo, where I'm from, we just celebrated Juneteenth, and we have one of the largest Juneteenth festivals. This is the first year that we are attempting to have a green and cleaner and, uh, Juneteenth. And in order to do that, we had to bring many partners together, whether it was the city, the county, the Olmstead Parks, volunteer environmental organizations. And we really had to start by teaching what does that look like for it to be greener and cleaner. The second thing is leading from the back. Oftentimes we want to be standing in the front, but the reality is you have to let the EJ communities lead. So I have an initiative, initiative with pastors. And to me, growing up in church, I'm a church girl, uh, the pastor is everything. He's the CEO, the father to many, he pays some people's bills, he's always praying for us. And giving them the opportunity to be the leaders and uplifting them find has been very powerful. Lastly, three, introducing creative ways to talk about the environment, whether it's a climate change carnival for the students and the children in the back, whether it's looking at doing a green church revival that sort of looks like a church revival slash having vendors and demonstrations like um, what, is, what do the EVs really look like that are affordable for folks in church. Like giving them a chance to do um, demonstrations on electric bikes, riding on an electric bus. What, you know, what does that really look like? Because some people have never been on one, right? I know what the brother said here, but some people have never in Buffalo been on an electric bus. And then thirdly, um, having ambassadors from the EJ community. We have an initiative in Buffalo, a clean mobility initiative, where we are engaging neighborhood leader groups that live right in the heart of the, the community. And initially, they were trying to look at how do we get them involved because they were talking about having 20 to 25 people involved. We did an exhaustive search. 75 people were interested and wanted to get involved. And what that takes is being creative and really looking at ways to be relatable. Finally, um, one of my dreams, and this is in the evening, World, is to have what I call an EV derby, similar to the Kentucky Derby, where we come out, the cars are paraded, you know, you got the big hats of faith make julep because we're not going to get drunk faster. <laughs> but really looking at creative and innovative ways that are relatable, fun, and bring all the community in. So I'll stop there. Let us all say amen. Yeah. I am Kip Banks, pastor of the East Washington Heights Baptist Church here in Southeast Washington, D.C. And uh, to uh, Antoine and to Darrell Jones and, and to my, all of you here at Subhold and to, as well, to uh, uh, Dr. Lemire Tehran and also to Faustinia El Marl. She said she's not a preacher, but she sounds like a preacher to me. Amen. She <laughs> preached a good sermon, isn't it? I just say I'm just glad to be here on today uh, with the combination of Juneteenth and uh, environmental energy and transportation justice. That's an exciting combination for me. I am actually a descendant by, of uh, a, a man who was there in Galveston, Texas, when uh, the general wrote to Texas to proclaim that the slaves were free. My great great grandfather was a slave to the founder of Galveston there. Uh, in Galveston Island. And Juneteenth for him, it was about freedom, about mobility. And that's what we're talking about, mobility and freedom, and to be, be able to breathe clean air and understanding that transportation is key because transportation is mobility. And so how important this discussion is. And the purpose for, for this panel, discussing best practices for how to engage the community. And I'm so happy to meet uh, 
fast fa- speed. Where have you been all my life? Amen. Because she can help me in so many ways. But one thing that I want you to understand, what, what my life has all been about, I, I'm a native of Los Angeles, California. I grew up in South Central LA. And you know, growing up in South Central LA, I'd go outside to play, and I would run, and I'd breathe in, and my lungs would hurt. Do you know why my lungs would hurt? Because the air was literally brown because of all the smoke. I, I would breathe in, and my lungs would hurt me. For college, I left LA and I went to UC Santa Cruz. Anybody ever been to Santa Cruz before? Raise your hand. Monterey Bay area, redwood forest, clean air, glistening bay. So I got LA out of my system, and now I dedicated my life on how to make a difference. And what I then I went to the University of Michigan, Michigan Wolverines, uh, to do a master's in public policy and a master's in urban planning with a concentration in transportation studies. Uh, because I wanted to find the answers to what was going on in the inner city, in the urban community. However, while I was there doing the master, the dual masters in urban planning and public policy, God said you can change all the policies you want, but you've also, it's also a, a faith issue as well that she talked about. And so you can change whatever policies you want to change, but there's a faith aspect to it. I came to Washington, D.C. 34 years ago to work with the U.S. Senate Budget Committee as a senior analyst for transportation, overseeing the whole budget for the Department of Transportation back in 1990. But again, as I did all those policies, I saw that there's a faith-based element to it all. And so in your communities, as you want a best practice for reaching the community, and she said, you've got you to speak to the faith leaders because they have their pulse on what's happening in the community. I serve as pastor of the East Washington Heights Baptist Church. I also serve as a senior strategist with Values Partnerships, which is headed by Joshua Dubois. And Joshua Dubois served as the head of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships under President Obama. And so we have an organization that's the nation's largest black-owned social impact agency. We have partnerships with Google, partnerships with Bill and Melinda Gates, partnership with Walmart, every individual corporation because they all understand that if they want to be effective in community outreach, they've got to reach the faith-based community. Uh, yes, we saw on yesterday, Louisiana passed a law, uh, putting, they, they, they passed a law, Ten Commandments in the schools. So to me, it's kind of sad to try to go back. And the whole point is that they recognize that the faith organizations are key in trying to effectuate change. And so as we seek environmental justice, as we seek equity in transportation, as we seek the green and the green transportation and have more EV stations, we've got to reach the faith-based community. And I'm happy to begin this discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Lex. Can we have a round of applause for our people? <laughs> now, before I open the floor for questions, I have my own questions for you three. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Teron. Uh, my first question, uh, you spoke so highly about um, making this a democracy or democratizing uh, the clean energy field. Um, can you speak on how can community engagement influence policy making in favor of sustainable transportation? So how do you democratize access to information? Number one, we have to go where people are and make sure that we're translating. For those that don't have the urban planning degree from the University of Michigan, you have to be able to translate that 10,000 plus page uh, draft environmental impact statement that most professionals are not gonna read, much less lay populations who are not doing this vocationally. So what does it look like? For my two colleagues to the right, you're doing it within the, the faith-based context, or you're doing it in the house of worship, Houses of worship, excuse me. I do it in public libraries. You're as likely to see me in a public library talking about ecology as you are uh, in my classroom if you're with me in Intro to Environmental Studies. I partner strategically with other organizations that we consider to be trusted messengers, uh, organizations that give folks CPR, organizations that give first aid trainings. Why is that important? Because if you're dealing in a high asthma environmental justice community, if you look on their mission statements, the word environmental justice may be nowhere listed in their mission and vision and goals, but certainly if you're talking about a high asthma community in South Central Los Angeles, you're talking about environmental justice community. So we gotta be very strategic about where we go to disseminate this information, 
like public libraries, like public schools, like universities, and we also have to be very strategic in how do we democratize access to that information. We got to be trusted uh, messengers. We got to translate those uh, environmental impact statements. We have to actually be willing to look at the brother earlier was talking about the bond situation in Virginia. We got to go to the public to make sure that they're on board. Hell, I don't know, you know the, the financial implications of a bond, but we need people who have the accounting or the economics background to make sure our people are with so that they can make informed decision they, uh, they can make informed decisions about these matters. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Um, now, Ms. Tina Morrow, you spoke so highly of all the great things that you guys are actually doing um, in Buffalo. Now, my question for you, can you speak on one of the biggest challenges that you have faced in actually engaging in these communities and just a simple testimony of how you overcame that challenge? Sure. Can you hear me still? Okay, great. Um, so one of the greatest challenges is misinformation. Oftentimes, before you can share what people should be excited about and you know add a new layer of things that they need to learn, you have to combat all of the negative messages. And you know, when it comes to clean energy in particular, there have been so many groups that are trying to reach out to the EJ community to get them invested. And they're selling them a bill of goods that is negative and not true. And so first you have to get past that. And one of the ways to counter that is exactly what Reverend Dr. Tehran was talking about, which is taking in trusted voices. Because that's one of the reasons I went to the pastors to begin with. Because I know, I used to, I used to work in politics running campaigns. And when it was time for you know, politicians to get elected, where do they go when they want to talk to our community? To the church. And how do they get in? They got to get their permission from the pastor. So I knew that if I can get pastors on board, then they will open the door to their parishioners. And so um, that's been, it's working well. <laughs> that is one of the greatest ways, but first you also have to connect with the pastor, right? Because as I mentioned, they're very, very busy people. And so just to get a meeting sometimes with a pastor, no offense pastor, it could take six months. <laughs> I, trust me, I know. Um, but if you are intentional, and you reach out and you do get the yes, then that opens the floodgates because the pastors are gonna recommend people. Because often we think some of the leaders are people we see before us. The true leaders are the ones that are working behind the scenes. And if you can get them on board, the world will be a oyster. Thank you so much for that. Now, last but not least, uh, Pastor Dr. Banks. Um, you spoke so highly on what the faith-based community can do uh, in the clean energy field. Now, my question for you is, how can we effectively engage youth in schools in sustainable uh, transportation initiatives? That is so important. I always like to say, when it comes to green technology, green transportation, and particularly for us in the urban community, it is not easy being green. Uh, because particularly for urban use, sometimes even in the urban community, it's not the sexiest thing that there is. There are other issues that come more to the forefront. Uh, and in speaking of Juneteenth, I also want you to know that my cousin is Opal Lee, the grandmother of Juneteenth. You all may have seen her. Uh, her, her mother and my grandfather were brother and sister. And so for the longest time, when she would come to DC and I walk, she would stay in my basement, and now she goes to the White House and doesn't pay me any attention. But she always talks about the fact that, that some want to paint Juneteenth was just being for African Americans, because again, there are all these silos. And Juneteenth is not about African Americans, it's about everybody. And that's why the flag for Juneteenth is red, white, and blue. It's, it's not the traditional African American colors of, of, of red for the gold, I mean, red for the blood, yellow for the green for the land, but it's, it's red, white, and blue because it's for everybody. And so we have to work in particular to break down these silos. One of the biggest silos that that there is is a silo with you. We have to be intentional, as you talked about, about going to the high schools in our communities to get to know the principal, to get to know the officers in the school. The, the schools have programs where they want the kids to be engaged, and they're looking for us, they're looking for you to show up. As a business professional, they're looking for you to show up.
show up as a planner, as a community member. Uh, at, at East Washington Heights Church, we have a program on first Saturdays. We have 30 youth from the community, from Anacostia High School, Malou High School. They come faithfully. The program begins at 9. Half of them, they are there at 845, and they're there ready to serve the community. How do we engage them? Well, the way that we engage them is, is that we give them a stipend. We give them a $40 stipend. And they come and we feed them too. You, you gotta feed the young people, amen. Yeah. They like to eat. So we, we feed them, and then we talk to them, and then we have them serve the senior citizens of the community by mowing lawns and raking leaves and doing work. And at the end, they get that $40 stipend. And we talk to them about what they're gonna spend it on, and sometimes they spend it on, you know, things they shouldn't be spending it on. But the point I'm making is that you gotta be intentional in trying to break these silos. There are too many silos between black and white, poor and the unpoor. And my cousin Hope always says we have to love everybody. We've got to be intentional of, of reaching across the board and talking with people who we may not even like. Amen. I was in Boston on Monday and was on the plane. The fellow sat next to me, tall, a Caucasian guy with a beard, looked nothing like me. And he and I took a conversation. We talked the whole way from Boston all the way to Washington, D.C. Amen. And so we got to be intentional in trying to reach our youth in, in your community, where you live, where your business is. Go to the high school. Talk to the principal. Talk to the counselors. Ask what the youth are doing and how you can help. And that will go a long way. Thank you so much. Um, can we have one more round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> now, we want to open the floor. Does anyone have any questions um, for any of our panelists? Yes, sir. Uh, Jamal Freeman, I'm a candidate for uh, DCW here in Washington, D.C., and I'm here to learn as much as I can about transformative policies that we can uh, put in place. And this gentleman here spoke to um, some of the things that we were too late to do um, to address some of these inequities. But I'd like to know, what is it that we can do now that could possibly turn the tide on some of these policies that have been plaguing our communities for far too long. We know that uh, the asthma is higher in our community is the reason for that. We know that um, um, most people in Ward 8, for example, don't have uh, a car as a reason for that. But what are some of these policies that we can do that he would, um, if he had a magic wand and was in charge or maybe was uh, in Congress, what were some of the policies that he'd like to see implemented to address some of these issues? Thank you for that question, and I will take uh, my brother to the right's uh, commentary on stipends or honorariums, and I'll say let's amplify that. So let's go beyond $40 for youth. Let's turn these questions into workforce development opportunities for DC residents, for Montgomery County residents, for PG County residents, for Baltimore County residents. So uh, I think there was an app that Chargilla mentioned a little bit earlier. Is that a local company? And if it is, who owns it? Whether or not it is local, that's irrelevant, but the point I'm making is anytime we're talking about renewable energy, anytime we're talking about EVs, what are the implications for your local work for local workforce, excuse me? And not just the question of how much is somebody making, do folks have access to information, do folks have access to livable wages, do folks have access to health care? So that needs to be the start of the conversation and the end of the conversation. The honorarium that I give when folks come out and plant trees with me and learn how to use environmental science forestry software, we pay folks about $300, $500. That's enough to pay somebody's electric bill maybe for two summer months. You graduate when you start talking about long-term systemic work. I think we get more brothers and sisters in D.C. making $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 per year. So unless we're clearly articulating well, what are the job implications and not just jingling the magic wand of jobs, what does training look like, right? Are people getting paid to train? Those are the types of serious questions that we have to graduate to if we're legitimately talking about economic justice and environmental justice. And I'd be happy to talk with you further if you want to build on this after the conversation. Thank you, guys. Uh, let me go to my brother in the back, and then I can answer this class. Uh, this is for the uh, pastor. Um, can you can you just touch on how the environmental justice piece impacts 
the youth violence and some of the things you guys are doing to address that? Well, from a, uh, just overall as, as people, we know that we find healing in the environment. We find healing in the environment. One of the amazing things about Washington, D.C. is we have some of the most uh, amazing uh, environmental treasures uh, in the urban environment, like the Kenilworth Aquatic Garden, uh, which if you go to those gardens, they're just so peaceful. You can't go in that garden and not have a feeling of peace come over you. Uh, for those who do follow the Bible, it says that the Lord restores my soul and again leads me besides still it leads me to green pastures and beside the still quiet waters. Well, one of the reasons why uh, there is so much violence is because we don't have peace. One of the reasons we don't have the peace is because we're not taking care of the environment. Uh, think about how much peace you feel when you see a, a flower or see the birds, uh, the, the peace that it brings. And certainly, as we destroy the environment, we destroy ourselves. And so there's a linkage there. And we have to get the youth to understand what that linkage is. So it's what we do at the East Washington Heights Baptist Church as we have the youth working in the rain garden to prune the rain garden, as we have the youth to pick up the trash that, that litters off the, the streets. I mean, you feel better when you don't see trash on the streets. You feel better when you see the mountains and breathe the air and see the birds. And so there's a linkage, and we have to make that linkage. And that's what's so powerful about, uh, 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 that's what's so powerful about uh, environmental transportation, green transportation, is that it's the opportunity to provide jobs, but also to impact the environment. And there's a synergy there because as we help the environment, we also help the people to get healthier and better. And it all goes together, making us all healthy and whole to the glory of God. Okay. Okay. Uh, I also want to add to that uh, um, part of the EPA initiative that's happening, where they are really trying to draw young people in because. Dr. Teron can talk about the studies that talk about with the heat index going up, um, people, you know, people get very upset in the rage that happens. Think about when you get hot, you're like, I need to get cool, right? And um, this EPA initiative is really um, listening to the young people, having them to talk about innovative and creative ways to make an impact in their community, and then providing opportunities to plant trees and to you know, develop more of the tree canopy in environmental justice neighborhoods. Thank you. What's that? Yes, my name is Ron Bethay. And the reason why I, I'm very much interested in this particular panel is because that's what I focus my show, Solar Now, the Future with his Economic Impact on Black America. And one of our founding members of, of our group of the National Association of Blacks and Solar, Joe by the name of Mr. Mark Davis. He has a company called WDC Solar. He's located on Fairline Avenue by the Big Chair. He runs the Workforce Development Training Program. Now, they started a program back in 2010 called the Soul for All Program. Most people don't know that this $7 billion program started here as a pilot. My problem is there was a group here called David Woods United that had an educational component showing people how to organize co-ops in their own communities. Young people, old people. But Mr. Davis said something to me one day that really hit because I, I, I go over and I speak to the graduates that's coming through his workforce development training report. Grid Alternatives is located at 1629. These organizations like Grid that's just it's getting ready to receive $156 million. All this money that is pouring out, I want to know, have anyone reached out to the ministers or the EJ community to bring y'all into the table to make sure that when our workforce development companies, the few African-American-based firms we have, have projects that they can give jobs to our young people after they get that training. It's one thing to train a person, it's another thing to train a person and you don't have a job for them. And I found in, 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 in my work in going out to, in reaching out to the community that the developers who we see building all these buildings are the decision makers 
on whether they're going to put commercial uh, a solar in the shopping mall at Alabama and, and Good Hope Road. These are some of the entities, and, I, and I'm going to reach out to y'all to, to give you my information to see how we can put these folks in the room together because, as you say, our young people, they, they, it's not on them, it's on us. Yes, and, and, and they are eager, and they want to work. They want opportunities. But unless we can scale the few businesses out of over 11,000 solar installation and design firms, we got less than 35. And these are the issues that we have. We simply cannot allow $1.7 trillion to be spent and less than 2% of that money is going to our entities and our nonprofits and our organizations because y'all are the ones doing the work behind the scenes you need to support. And that's, 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 that's a major problem that I discovered and it's a disconnect because our politicians are some of them are very uneducated around these issues. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the fact that uh, with the D.C. Council to, from the Maryland State Assembly, they they only such 90 days. And I and I worked very, very hard to get the Justice for the Initiative introduced in Maryland. It couldn't get out of committee. But I didn't expect it to get out of committee at first because I knew it was going to be pushed back. They got somebody, something called gun gunslingers. I call them lobbyists. And money goes flows both ways. So, with that being said, uh, Maryland received $12.4 billion of, of January 1, 2024, 174 projects funded in Maryland, and not one African American firm is a lead contract on one of these major contracts. Concept. So, that's what I'm saying. I think we're going to have to have the face based community and, and, and these developers. And our politicians and our and our politicians in the same room because it's not our young people's fault. Outstanding, outstanding presentation and information. No, I have not heard about what you shared about, and that's why these forums are so essential. I am excited that under Antoine uh, Thompson's leadership, there is a faith-based council as part of the Greater Washington Regional uh, Clean Cities Coalition. And we are planning uh, to have forums coming up uh, with faith leaders. And talking about faith leaders, another strategy that I want to inform you of the meeting with them in, in your community, they have ministerial alliances. And these ministerial alliances are looking for partnerships. And they love it when you feed them. If, if you want to know how to meet with the pastor, like, feed the pastor, amen. It goes a long way. Fried chicken is, well, not always fried chicken, but pastors like to eat. But we are planning to have some upcoming forums uh, here in DC. And, and the information that you share, it would be excellent if you could come to that forum and share what you share. Because again, it's all about the partnerships, us all working together, because we all have the same goal and that is cleaning the air and advancing our community and getting jobs all for the goodness of all of mankind. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Um, I don't need this time for you guys to think for closing remarks for one minute. Once again, Lemire to run. I was introduced as a doctor, but if anybody here falls out, I can't help you. But what I can do is, if you want to talk ecology, if you want your son and daughter to get outside, let's plant some trees together. Let's talk about energy policy in this city. Let's talk about energy burdens. If you want to talk about those type of things, get in contact with me. It's a lot of good work that we can do together. I believe in public science and environmental decision making. So yeah, it's nice for the bureaucracy to have whatever channel they have to influence policy, but at the end of the day, if we're not controlling our own future, then it's the same old status quo. We're depending on 435 people to set the temperature. We're depending on those people in 90 days to do, you know, make, wave that magic wand, as the brother said earlier. So if we want to really democratize this whole conversation, let's go all in on public science, and also let's hold power accountable. With that being said, thank you very much for your time. And I'm Faustenia Morrow. Um, I'm the principal at the Monarch of Infinite Possibilities. I focus on raising the level of the environment with the faith-based community and with the BIPOC community. 
And I've been gathering pastors together. It's a global initiative with the goal of making sure as trusted voices, they're the leaders. And remember I talked about taking the knot out. I had this terrible knot in the necklace that I had, and I was trying to pull it and tear it apart. Um, and then I took patience and time. And it took me a little while, but I looked at the patterns that needed to be unraveled in order to restore it to whole. And when I did that, I ended up taking the knot out of my necklace. And I think we can do that for the community. And what does not represent, because I know you want to know what the acronym stands for, um, know-it-alls, never listening to the environmental justice community, and then overcomplicating the process and always trying to tell them what to do instead of being teachable. Let's take the knot out. Again, I am Kip Banks, pastor of the East Washington Heights Baptist Church. My cousin is Dr. Opalee, the grandmother of Juneteenth. And in her spirit, she would say, uh, as this is a Juneteenth forum, the best practice for, uh, again, for community education, engagement, and outreach and sustainability is to work with all people to reach out to the high school, to reach out to the faith leaders, to reach out to the government, and to do so through the Greater Washington Clean Cities Coalition. Support this coalition. Pay your dues, pay your money. Let's all work together. Someone said amen. <laughs> Let's all work together. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we got our final panel for the day. Um, we'll have our team come up. Just a couple quick uh, announcements while we're transitioning to our final panel on workforce development.